All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our Talent Tuesday uh, Business Analytic Fundamentals. Uh, we're super excited to be joined here with uh, Plant Moran today. Plant Moran is actually our sponsor for the Talent Tuesday series, so it's really great to be able to hear from them a little bit um, on this series. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, and I would just like to start off by introducing our sponsor here uh, with a little information for you. So Plant Moran is among the nation's largest accounting, tax consulting, and wealth management firms and provides a full line of services and organizations in the following industries. Manufacturing and distributing, financial services, service, healthcare, private equity, public sector, real estate, construction, and energy. Plant Moran has a staff of over uh, 3,300 professionals throughout the United States with international offices, offices in Shanghai, China, Mumbai, India, Tokyo, Japan, and Monterey, Mexico. In Colorado, Plant Moran has served its Colorado clients for more than 40 years with offices in Broomfield, Denver, and Fort Collins. Plant Moran has been recognized by a number of organizations, including the Fortune magazine, as one of the country's best places to work. So if you want more information, uh, you can check out plantmoran.com, but we're also going to go ahead and hear from a couple of um, Plant Moran's folks here. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and do a quick little introduction of our speakers this morning. So we have Adam here, and he is the manager of business analytics consulting. Um, Adam has over 15 years of experience in the information technology, focusing on business intelligence, analytics, system implementations, and project management. Adam le leads the key focus groups for Plant Moran and works with organizations to better leverage technology and improve operations internally for his clients. His exper expertise includes project management, strategic business analytics implementation, data governments, and analytic design. He has managed projects in close coordination with the client, architect, and vendor managers. Prior to joining Plant Moran, Adam was the business was the director of business analytics at Keypoint Government Solutions and team lead at Nutrien Business Intelligent Decision Support. He holds a bachelor's of art degree from in music with math mathematics emphasis in computer science from University of Northern Colorado certificates in PMP from Colorado State University, Tableau Professional, TOGAF, International Agrum <laughs> Education and Sacrum Masters from the Sacrum Alliance. So very excited to hear a little bit about his expertise. And I'd also like to introduce Stuart, who is a Senior Manager of Business Analytics Consulting. Stuart is an analytics consulting manager with over 10 years of experience in data analytics, data management, statistics, and business intelligence. He combines a, his background in analytics with his communication skills to present actionable data, stories, and create insights for his customers. Throughout his career, Stuart has assisted organizations in making data-driven decisions across operational, financial, and human resource business units. As a consultant, Stuart helps his clients develop pragmatic and creative data-driven solutions that help them to increase value, manage risk, reduce cost, and optimize their decision-making strategies. Stuart holds a master's degree in applied statistics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, an undergraduate degree in statistics and economics from the University of Georgia. And Stuart has been with Point Moran for eight years. So with that, I would like to go ahead and turn Turn it over to Stuart and Adam here so that they can uh, present for us. Awesome, thank you, Taylor. I really appreciate that. I think Adam would agree you made us sound much more impressive uh, that, than we feel. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. And just kind of get one confirmation that this, uh, this can be seen. Good, awesome. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about business analytics today. We won't, um, go through intros again, but really just understanding or we want to present harnessing analytics for business excellence, right? This is an industry agnostic um, approach. Doesn't matter if you're in financial services, if you're in the public sector, if you're in the nonprofit arena, if you're in the commercial area, um, all of these or these topics that we're going to cover today are applicable um, for, uh, across industries, regardless of um, 
what products you're making, the customers you're serving, the communities you're serving. Um, this all can be information that you take back um, and leverage to, to make better decisions. Taylor went over a fantastic intro, so I'll skip this slide, but this will be available for distribution later. And I'm gonna pass it to my colleague, Adam, to talk a little bit about Plant Moran. And Adam, just let me know when to go to the next slide and I'll do my best to, uh, to make sure I'm uh, paying attention. I think Adam is fixing his audio, just one second. I can't hear you, Adam. I, th I think you were doing a mic check. Okay, while Adam is uh, fixing the audio, I'm I'm happy to give a background, and we'll we'll uh, we'll switch up the order a little bit. So, just about Plant Moran, uh, as, as Taylor mentioned in her intro, uh, we're one of the nation's largest certified public accounting and advisory firms. We have audit, tax, wealth management. Uh, and consulting. Um, we provide a variety of services with a large geographic footprint. We've been serving the Colorado footprint for over 40 years. Uh, you probably remember Plant Moran is um, EKSNH. Um, we had a merger a few years ago, um, and we've you know since uh, developed a, a more broad range of services with a, a broader client base, but you know, the same level of quality and the same level of expertise, if not expanded, right? We go to market by industry. So we have folks who work with manufacturers and distributors uh, for their entire career. The same thing goes for uh, the healthcare industry. We have folks who have spent uh, their professional careers working with uh, assisted living, living facilities. Uh, we have a dedicated service offering called Plant Marin Living For to help uh, uh, assisted living facilities understand their footprint, where should they expand, what different decisions they need to make for their business. So we're not just tax and audit. Um, it's surprising to some, but we, you know, we have a variety of services. We work with within the private equity space. We work within family offices, and we've been doing this for a very, very long time. Uh, we've actually, we just hit 100 years uh, last week, All right, So we were founded in 1924. We have um, you know, Taylor, I think we gave you some data numbers. We have almost 4,000 total staff now with almost 400 partners and affiliated entity members. Um, we're a tax and audit firm, so we have, you know, almost over 1,300 CPAs. And as Taylor mentioned in the intro, we have several international offices, including Mumbai, uh, Shanghai, um, and even Monterey, Mexico. So we're uh, all over. Um, we serve the entire uh, United States, not just the mainland. We have clients in Hawaii. That's that's a that's a project that everybody tries to get uh, to get on, but you know we do a variety of services in a variety of industries across the country and really across the world, around the world. Uh, we focus on the middle market, right? So um, clients that uh, have that middle market customer base, uh, a lot of different um, business to business, right? Suppliers, whether that be in the auto space, in food and beverage, and consumer and consumer packaged goods family businesses and family offices. We work with publicly traded companies, privately held companies, private equity, equity owned companies. Um, and we have a variety of services in the public sector and nonprofit space as well, right? And then our, P, uh, our PMFA, our wealth management service offering, we work with high net worth individuals to help them understand or help them really build out a, uh, sometimes a transition plan, a family plan and a state plan to help them manage uh, their wealth for the generations and their family to come. But really what makes us so special is um, our one firm firm philosophy. So Adam and I focus on analytics, but we don't believe in uh, just having analytics uh, professionals working uh, with our clients or just having um, our tax professionals or our assurance professionals working with our clients. We really uh, bring the whole firm um, to our clients and to our prospects. So if you're if you have an analytics need, you'll work with Adam or myself, as well as you know the, the variety of folks in our practice. But you also will have, if you're a manufacturer or distributor, you'll have the manufacturing expertise that we bring to the table. So we do a lot of 
um, joint work across our different industries for our clients to make sure we're bringing the right team to the table, right? So we're not just dealing with your data. We're also dealing with the context uh, within your business model. We're dealing with the context within your industry. Um, and we're making sure that we're bringing a complete consulting um, or a complete professional services offering to your team. Um, so we have, you know, team of experts. We have, um, we believe in, in long-term serving our clients, right? You're not gonna have a shuffle of different consultants or managers or partners working with your, um, you know, with your organization. Um, we, we really believe in building those relationships um, and maintaining those relationships and, and really driving the quality of work that we bring, uh, bring to our clients. Um, just a, a quick overview of, of our expertise to support your needs. I'm back, by the way, Stuart. I, uh, I, I, I literally went to unmute and then it everything crashed. It was incredible. It's, it's all good. Do you want to do you want to tackle this, Adam? We were sure. Here. Yeah. So so Stuart mentioned the one firm firm, and, and that's true. And it is different from other other firms where um certain um areas of consulting firms, tax on auto firms will will be very uh how do I say it, financially centered. Um, meaning that audit might have a, a, a different goal than, than tax and consulting. And, and what, what that means is since we're considered one firm firm that really we're all interested, each group is interested in its, um, in the success of the others. So, um, what that means for our clients is that, uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to be siloed in, in, in our offerings. So not only do we have a laundry list of consulting things that we can do, but um, if there are options or opportunities uh, in, in the audit or tax or wealth management space, we're happy to, uh, to, 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 to make those introductions as appropriate. So um, as you can see here, it is pretty vast on the different offerings that, that we have within the firm. So um, you know, from, from what I said, consulting to tax and audit and wealth management, um, and then everything underneath practically. So just know that in general, that if there's something that, that you need help with, there's a chance that plant brand can, can, can deliver on that. Um, and so today we're going to, we're going to focus on these on two little tiny pieces, which is business analytics and, uh, technology consulting. So um, in general, our, our, our management consultants have, have a lot of different experience. We have uh, a, a number of employees and staff that, that we're focused on growing um, eventually to get the partner someday. And, and, and in order to do that, it's about um, creating large swaths of experience and expertise within our firm, within technologies, and with industries. So you'll see here, we focus on industries, manufacturing, development, construction, healthcare, public sector, K-12. I tend to spend a lot of time in public sector and um, education where we, um, where I spend a lot of time responding to RFPs and managing projects uh, with, with, our, with our, our government officials. Uh, we're also geographically distributed um, through all sorts of states, but what we what we consider are some of our strategic states are Colorado, Michigan, Illinois, Florida, and Texas. I live in Greeley. Um, in fact, right now I'm in Fort Collins, so um, I've lived here for about 20 years, and um, it's my new home. Um, we are also tool agnostic, and what that means is, uh, depending upon the data and analytics tool that would best fit the solution, that's generally what we would bring to the table. So um, we're not the type of firm or, or, or group that would say, you have to use um, Power BI for everything, or you have to use Microsoft for everything. It, it We bring um, a number of experiences to the table in these different technologies. And uh, we believe that the, the technology shouldn't dictate the solution, but the, the solution should dictate what technology and tool set is used. 
All right. Um, so let's see here. Sorry, I'm just, everything just restarted for me. So with business analytics, what we're looking at is really harnessing your data, figuring out what we can do to best serve serve the situation. So if you wanna go into the next one, um, this is really about taking data that you have and being able to make better business decisions. I think you talked about that a minute ago, Stuart, about really, um, maximizing your opportunity with your data. And so we're going to look here in a little bit about data management and data transformations as well as visualizations. And so Stuart's got a really nice uh, um, uh, use case as well as um, how do you get the data there to use it. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look here in just a second. So with our business analytics services, what you really have are these areas. So Analytics advisory is going to be about um, making sure your solution is built for you so it does solve your problems. Um, data management, and again, these highlighted areas is where we're going to focus, but data management is, uh, as we'll see in a few seconds, what do you do with all of the data? So you, if you ask people, you say, oh, we have a lot of data. We're really data rich, but they may not know how to use the data, so they're the usage of the data may create create uh, issues there. So then we've got business intelligence. Business intelligence is going to be well. Now we've got our data in a good area. We can we 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 we've got it in a um, uh, database or data warehouse. So what do you do with it now? So now you can start using the data for those business um, driven decisions or data driven decisions through data discovery, uh, visualizations, um, and other things like that. There's a lot of other areas here you can see data governance is really hot and heavy right now because uh, a lot of times people like to protect their data. Who owns the data? What is the, the version of the truth? What, what is my actual KPI and what number in my data um, is responsible for that? So data governance is a big one. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of others there that we could probably spend the whole day talking about. Absolutely. And, I, and so... You know, thanks, Adam. Right, this is this is our breadth of services. Let's get a little more specific and a little more tactical, though. Right, so we think about where to start. So, if you're implementing or enhancing analytics at your organization, do any of these things sound familiar? Right, and Adam even even mentioned it. We, you know, we're data driven, but data starved. Right, or or said differently, we're data rich, but we're information poor. Right, everywhere I look. People have different versions of the same data. I don't know what to believe. We want to do this analysis, but it takes two weeks to complete. Now it's too late. It's outdated. There's no consistency. I don't want to spend every weekend dragging data out of spreadsheets, right? Like these things are painful. Um, and so where analytics comes into play is uh, making, making this part of your life a lot easier, right? And it's Yes, there is lift in terms of getting it centralized and getting data in the right format, but everybody wants to get to, okay, that report that I can view on my phone, right? Or how do, how do I know it immediately um, where my high-performing, either my high-performing people are, my, my well-performing products are? What if this job that I bid on, is it the right amount? Did, did I underbid or did I overbid? Am I, you know, when I compare my performance to my budget, how does that stack up so I don't make the same mistakes going forward? These are all the questions that analytics can help answer. And one of the ones that we are seeing a lot more of as we see more activity with, within the market with mergers and acquisitions is if you have a lot of different systems that, you know, perhaps you don't want to go through a large scale implementation, which we help with also, but maybe you don't, you're not ready for that. How do we bring all of that data together in order to tell the right story to help drive our business. So these are common things that we hear, regardless of industry, regardless of size of the company, regardless of the, um, you know, the type of questions they, they want to answer eventually, a lot of this really, it feels familiar and, and quite frankly, it's not a lot of fun to deal with. In order to handle these things, you really have to, you have to be honest with yourself about your analytics maturity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is our, this is our maturity scale that we like to leverage. It, it's a very, you know, it's our, it's our approach to making sure we understand where our clients are so we can best serve them. So 
most folks, most organizations are between level one and two, right? They're, they're spreadsheet driven. Two people can't create the same reports. You know, Adam, I know you've seen it at your clients in the public sector. I've seen it in my clients in the commercial sector all the time. Tell me how you got to this analysis. Well, I use this spreadsheet. I filter this. I do that. I copy and paste from here. And that's that's very error prone, right? When you have a lot of different areas where you can touch the data, if you're storing it in the same place where you're analyzing it, right? If you have a VLOOKUP that that breaks or you accidentally, you know, enter a an S instead of a five, now you get the NAs everywhere. I mean, those are those are very common problems that happen uh, at, at the level one at, at the at the first level. Right. A lot of folks will be happy. A lot of organizations will be content with getting to what we call what, what is level three. So um, enterprise level analytics. So you have a single source of truth. You have a, you know, you're, you can trust the analysis. You can trust the data. Your data is governed. It's focused on answering business questions. Right. We're not just here to do analytics for the sake of analytics. We're here to be solution driven. Um, and then the really, really high performing organizations from a data perspective get to level four and five where they're doing the predictive analytics, they're leveraging the machine learning applications, right? But you have to make sure you have a solid foundation if you're gonna trust that information, right? If you have garbage data that's coming in, you're not gonna get solid analysis that's coming out. And that can be just as dangerous as not having analytics at all, right? So you just wanna make sure you're, you're, you're taking the appropriate caution and you're building your data analytics programs or your analytics tool set in the right um, logical way to make the right decisions. So we're gonna talk about analytics is vast. We're gonna talk about two topics today. Um, we've, you know, Adam, as you teed it up, right? We're gonna talk data warehousing and visualizations. And we have a, uh, we're gonna go through the fundamentals and we have a case study um, you know, for a, uh, the bike company, right? Again, it's in the, this is an industry agnostic approach. Um, but we wanted to provide a kind of real life um, client based example that it, um, displays how we can leverage analytics to answer some pretty uh, to answer some questions in some in an interesting way. Right. So thanks, um, Stuart. So I'm going to talk about data warehousing and uh, we're going to first define data warehousing. Then we're going to go through, look at a use case, and then we're going to redefine it and just make sure it's kind of sinking in there. Um, so data warehousing is really about centralizing your data. So I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this. I'm not going to read from there, um, but this is good content to have because this is really the guts of, of creating what we call a data warehouse. Now, a lot of people um, will say, but I have a data mark or I have a data repository or um, I have a cube or, or, or something like that. So they're all similar. Um, they're all kind of zebras. Um, they all have, but they have different stripes, right? So um, a data warehouse is really a collection of data from several different store sources. So for example, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get in an example in just a minute, but high level, you've got a bunch of different computer systems or, or uh, maybe you have an ERP and then you have an inventory um, uh, system. Well, how do you get those, those databases to talk? Well, one solution is you can put it all in a data, data warehouse. And the idea about a data warehouse is refining the data to a point that it is that it has a reportable um, or has it has formed data and it's structured data. And I think you can probably go on to the next slide, but it has structured data so that you can um, be able to ingest it into visualization tools easily. So one of the highlighted things on this page says allows graceful extensibility of new and existing data. Great. So now I've got my data warehouse. I can get data into it, but I can also add other systems into it as I need to. Um, all of this data becomes then merged together through processes called extract, transform, and load, where you take the data and you might change it a little bit here and there so it's more consistent. For example, maybe you have a date field in your inventory system and you have a date field in your uh, ERP. One of them has um, spells out February 8th, 2020. 
but the other one says 2-8-2020. Um, well, the data system might see that as two different dates. So how do you make that the same thing? So it's about standardizing your data, making sure that it's um, consistent and, and also representing the truth. So uh, I think we can continue on. Yeah, just, just, just real quick, I think, um... I think Adam's spot on. And one of the other things is um, that, you know, that last bullet about insulating you from change, right? So if you think through um, your organization or your company going through an ERP migration, or maybe you're getting rid of an old accounting system and going to a new one, what happens to all that information if you don't have a place to store it? Sure, you can have it on somebody's shared drive or a shared network drive that there's a bunch of spreadsheets, but what happens if somebody accidentally goes in and saves over it or or deletes it or removes it, right? There's no mm -hmm. um, there's no really way to insulate yourself from that type of um, not malicious action, right? But but still action that could hurt the business. Um, what where a data warehouse comes into play, a properly governed one, you can have that information forever, right? It's your data warehouse, you own it. Uh, you have that information. You can sure. get you can get rid of an accounting system, get a new one. You can get rid of that new one, get another one. You can still store that data within, you know, um, in perpetuity, so you're able to access it, so your reports don't break. Right? It would it would be a it would be a shame of of the the great reports and KPIs and all those things that you built if they're connected directly to your system, and now your executive team decides that that system isn't the right investment um, of of dollars or of capital expenditure for the organization, now what happens, right? So um, it is tech, you know, it allows you to add new systems and existing data, but really, you know, pr protecting yourself and fu future proofing your organization and keeping that data at the tip of your fingertips, I think is really, really important. You know, and Stuart, not to keep belaboring the subject, but um, one of the, a lot of times with data warehouse implementations will assist in a new ERP implementation. So um, typically if you get a new ERP, you'll wanna migrate some data to that ERP. Well, what do you do with the data you're not migrating? The historical data. Um, and let's say you wanna keep it, great. Well, how do you report off of it? Well, you can put, put it in the data warehouse. And you can create uh, an opportunity for you to not only um, report off your current current transactions, open transactions, but also anything that was historical. So data warehouses are kind of multifaceted, ser serve a lot of uh, purposes. So, so here we go. We got our data warehousing case, case study um, and we got a bike company and they've got a lot of disparate sources. So they've got an HR system, they've got a CRM system, they've got a budgeting system, they've got an ERP. Um, so none of these systems talk to each other. So what are they going to do? So they need that they, they they have an idea they need to they need to start bringing this data together so they can report off of it. Um, so they can do month end reporting, they need to be able to make some decisions, maybe some forecasting, they could even they can get um, pretty fancy with the different opportunities that they have when they combine it. So what do they do? Um, go ahead and go next. So if you look here, the um, the the data the data is you know we got a few different tables here. So in one table you've got some product information, another table you got sales forecasting, and then in another one you've got orders. So one's about um, um, getting some getting information or getting products, another one selling products, and then the other one is also forecasting. So yeah, these are all kind of showing things, but you can tell they all come from different systems. Well, what if that was all in one spot? So that's what we're that's what we want to do. We want to take that data. So I said extract, transform, and load earlier. So this is the example or visualization that supports that. We're going to extract the data from our budget, HR, CRM, and ERP, and we're going to put it into and we're going to put it into a staging database. The staging database is where we're going to do data cleansing and matching and standardizing. Remember, I talked about data or dates being different. Well, here's an opportunity where we can start making those dates match. Uh, we can really start um, understanding the best way to look at our data. 
So we get that data cleansed. It looks good. It, it's ready to be loaded into a warehouse. And once it's in the warehouse, we, we're going to optimize that for our reporting KPIs. So when you develop these warehouses, and you need to kind of think about the end in mind, meaning what type of visualizations, what is my use case that I want to, to see? Great, we took all of our bike store data and we put it into a warehouse, but what's the purpose? Why do we need to do this? And so um, you would start, like I said, with the, the end in mind. So uh, one of these bullets says that uh, we, we, wanted, we want to budget forecast. Great, perfect. So now what we're going to do is develop our data warehouse so that it supports that initiative. Um, am I missing anything on here? Stuart? Oh, no, I, I, I don't think I so. I went off script, pretty off script. No, no, no I, I think it was great, Adam. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the headline here, right, is disparate systems not talking to each other. Maybe you have some stuff that lives in Excel. Maybe you have mm -hmm. some stuff that lives in your ERP. Maybe you want to understand what is that opportunities or, or, you know, opportunities to orders pipeline look like, right? But your, your CRM system is completely separate uh, from your ERP transactional system and how, and they, there's no built-in connections for those, for those systems to talk to each other, right? I mean, the, the solution, that pain, how to solve that pain uh, is through a data warehouse, right? And then you can leverage that standardized data warehouse to get into uh, some visualizations to really drive yeah. you're making for your business. Before you go on, sure. uh, this is a great transition, Stuart. I don't want to take that away from me. Maybe uh, when I finish, you can do that again because it was such a good transition. Great. But um, I, I've been on site with many clients and and just talking about, hey, what do you do? What's your month end? For, uh, talking to like a, an account payable person. Hey, what's your month end process is like? Well, First, I got to go into the, the um, ERP to get my sales data. Then after that, I've got to go into the CRM to pull my um, forecast so I understand where we're going to be selling. And then after that, I need to act, um, take a spreadsheet and I do a VLOOKUP and I put all of that together. Um, and then, um, but then someone will email me later that week that says, something change and I'll have to go back through and I'll have to reconcile all that. So then I say, how long does that usually take? And they're like, oh, probably about 40 hours. So one, one whole week of the entire month, they're just compiling data. And so, you know, a, a data warehouse will, will alleviate a lot of that pain. Okay. That's all I want to say. No, I think, I think that's a great point. I think it's a great point. Um, so if we get into we have our data consolidated. It's clean, right? We 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 aren't spending our forty hours a week, uh, every month to get it done. It's it's in our data warehouse. We're good to go. What do we do with it, right? And so, really, the visualization, same company, same same text. So I won't repeat it here. But now we're getting into, you know, we're getting into the fun and sexy part of analytics. Quite frankly, right? At, at least Adam and I think the data warehousing part is fun and, and interesting mm -hmm. and and attractive part of that. But but. Generally speaking, you want to see the pretty pictures and you want to be able to derive some insights from your data. So what did this company do? They said, hey, we have our data warehouse. Now we're going to leverage um, a BI tool called Tableau. Again, if they were on a Microsoft stack, right, they would leverage Power BI to drive some of this intelligence. But they want to see uh, a few things, right? They want to understand their profitability. They want to understand how they're performing by four, you know, compared to their forecast. And they really want to see in detail what their sales orders are doing. What's the product mix, right? How are our high margin uh, products performing compared to our low margin parts? What, and that's going to drive a lot of different decisions operationally on, okay, maybe we need to source some different suppliers. Maybe we need to make some different decisions on what we actually are producing because it's really not driving uh, our bottom line in a way that we would like it to. So these are some examples of some business intelligence reports, and I'm actually just going to pull up Tableau and go from and go from there. But if you see, this is this is in Tableau, right? Could you do this in Excel? Sure, right? Could you do this in a spreadsheet application? Sure. Maybe the functionality may not be as good, but still, regardless, this is 
directly related to having a centralized data repository. So they have that forecast file that was in Excel, that's in the data warehouse. They have their transactional data that's in the data warehouse. Now they're able to really see in detail what happened month over month over last year, right? So we had some really strong months. We forecasted okay for some months. We overperformed our forecast. Typically on average, we do okay, but what's really going on you know, at the end of the year, right? And so tools like Tableau, visualization and BI tools like Tableau and Power BI give you the functionality to drill in, right? You can say, oh, well, let me look at December and you'll see down at the bottom, I'm only looking at December. If I add September, let me see what's going on here. I'm able to see in detail by order um, down to what's driving my revenue. Why am I underperforming my forecast? I can see at multiple levels of detail at the monthly level down to the order level, which is my transaction detail. And that's what everybody wants to typically from an executive perspective, understand like, okay, what, what products are driving this? What customers are driving this? So we can make some decisions and maybe we forecast a lot better the next year, or maybe we make some operational changes that are going to lead to some financial impact, right? The, the power of these tools is not just the technology. It really is to drive businesses to make better decisions with their own data that they have um, that just probably needs to be cleaned up and transformed a little bit. Another one that's really, really popular, um, let go to back to my slideshow, uh, is what we call our Pareto chart, right? And so this is showing by product, uh, it can change it to by customer, um, by product right now, what the percent of my total margin is. So where am I making money? Uh, where am I being profitable and where am I not being profitable? So if I switch back to my Tableau book, workbook, I'm able to see very clearly, let's take this off. I'm able to see very clearly where my profitability uh, is happening, right? So if I look, I get to 30% of products and I'm already at 80% of my margin for, you know, for the year, right? Or for 2023, calendar year 2023. It begs the question like, okay, I'm getting better, right? I'm getting to my 100%, but like, why do I even, are these really adding value Right. Maybe we need to increase you know, our pricing or change our pricing strategy. Maybe we need to understand are our standard costs really accurate. But this this middle percent, like what what is what is the purpose of these here? Right. And then you really have to ask yourself the question, okay, once I get to you know this this product here, right? Now my my actual product margin is only 700 bucks for the full year, right? these products here are actually reducing my margin. And now it becomes a question of what am I, why am I doing these at all, right? And, 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 and I, we always caution clients here, right? Cause they, you know, uh, your CFO sees this and he's, he or she, they're, they're, they're going crazy and they're, they're, they're want to understand why do we do these products at all? And it may be a business decision, right? Maybe these, maybe these products are really complex, um, but that's driving your business. You have to have this business in order to get these simpler products um, for that same customer, right? So perhaps you have to you have to eat this loss, but at least you would know why, right? And at least you can understand why your margin is being driven down as opposed to just compiling spreadsheets, not having repeatable processes. You can drill this down on a month by month basis. You can look at specific customers and understand their distribution. You can keep it to specific product groups and understand that. Um, and I know we're 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 very much talking commercially and in the commercial sector, but even in terms of the public sector, Adam, right? Like understanding how um, your students are performing, right? Or understanding Absolutely. how um, you know maybe your grant process is a your grant writing process. Like, why aren't we winning mm -hmm. these grants? If you're collecting that information, is it you know a specific person that's winning more grants or a specific organization? Maybe it's a type of grant that you're applying to, you're able to slice and dice and cut that data in a way that's really, really driving your insights as opposed to just going with your gut, right? Or well, it's it's always been that way. We know, we we know, how do you know? I know because I know, right? Like how many times, <laughs> have, how many times have we heard that from uh, from our clients, you know, Adam, like, well, like show me, right? Like, oh, well, you know, and, and then once you get to, well, yes. you know, you can kind of, uh, you can you can paint that picture for yourself, right? So you can actually answer these questions with data, with information, 
your information and really drive to that outcome. Yeah, Adam, there it's, it's there from the from the public. Yeah, side? yeah. Well, from the public. Well, even when I used to work at Nutrien, so that's an agricultural company, it used to be called United Agro Products. Um, in the data and analytics, that we had sales reps. Oh, so and so, that's our best customer. That's our best customer. And then we we did analysis like this after we built our warehouse. We said, well, we're losing money on them every year. Like, what, what's going on? So, so those types of things. But yeah, we did this also the same analysis on um, that helped um, a school district in Ohio understand their student population and the characteristics on um, graduation percentages. Yep. And so it, it, it really helped them understand what class makeup um, produced a successful student. And then also provide them warning flags for if a student wasn't getting enough credit hours and um, the characteristics behind that and the profile. So quite interesting. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and with something like that, right, maybe a um, early intervention program is, is the result of that, right? Understanding, yep. okay, if we see these, if these, if we have two or more flags, we have to have some outreach. And historically, right, at least in my experience, way back in the day in college, um, I think having that tool for for a you know a counselor or an admissions office or what have you can be very very powerful because it it creates efficiencies in their day to day right and that's really that's really what analytics is for is to reduce that amount of pain that people are feeling regardless if it's commercial nonprofit education right it's to it's to leverage it to make better decisions for the organization now it doesn't have to be business driven but it does have to be um, you know, it can be organizationally specific. Another one that we we see commonly in the commercial sector is like, what is the mix of my products, right? So I'm gonna go back to my Tableau workbook, just being able to see mix, right? Um, and if I look at my my uh, legend, and, and I apologize, it's kind of small on this screen, but you know I have classified my different products as high, medium, low, and negative. Um, if I want to highlight my negative ones, right, the interactivity, the 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 actions that are available in these softwares, in software, specifically business intelligence software, is really powerful. And I can see, okay, like this is how I'm performing. But what if the CFO says, hey, like, you know, what if we exclude these negative products? Like, what happens to our bottom line um, from our sales? Like, All right, well, we'll exclude them. Now we're over five hundred thousand in revenue in two months. We eliminated a lot of a lot of waste. Again, like these are hypotheticals, um, scenarios that you can see, but you have to understand the industrial and business context before you make those those sort of decisions, right? You want to make sure you're actually eliminating or reducing your loss for the right reason. You don't want to eliminate, you know, low margin products in order to uh, uh, at the expense of some of your higher products, right? So. Again, this is a demonstration of these capabilities, this activity. I'm um, able to see in detail, right? What are those? Well, what are these products for this month, right? What is that margin? And you're able to see the percent of revenue in that breakdown. So this is a really powerful way to understand what is the mix of our business. Uh, to Adam's point, we've had clients who, you know, community colleges. One example I think of Adam, they were having a parking space like shortage, right? And so. What was driving that? A lot of the, most of the early classes were overlapping with a lot of the midday classes. So in order to make sure there were enough spaces available for the students I and mean, for the faculty and the staff, they had to adjust those scheduling, the scheduling, otherwise they weren't gonna have enough space, right? Just frankly, not enough space for the amount of people they had. So it's those types of decisions that can be driven with analytics. Again, it doesn't just have to be uh, the business question, it can be organization. So we, we've talked a lot. We'll just go through some of our key takeaways. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, analytics should be used to address business issues and create efficiencies, right? Um, it's funny that this, this text is larger, uh, but, but, the, but the, point, the point remains the same, right? It can be a small project. You don't have to spend huge right. dollars for real value, right? In fact, 
some of the best analytics programs and analytics projects that we've done start, they start with a real small scope, right? You identify where you can get in quickly, you know, have an impact, make some change, and then it proves out the point of analytics and then you scale from there, right? Our, our approach, and I think this is true from both commercial and the public sector, is let's find the low hanging fruit. Let's make sure we we understand the business, understand the organization. Perhaps we do an assessment to to really, really make sure that we're we have the full picture. And let's let's drive from there, right? Let's start small and expand. Um, and then let's make sure we understand that that data warehousing piece, that extraction piece, is is I would say 95% of the time the biggest lift. Once we have the data in the right format, the reporting is fun. Right. We can we can we can try different things. We can try different visuals. We can help build that out in a way that is really insightful for the end user um, and repeatable for the organization. Yeah, yeah I just to chime in there. All of the, the product, the product. The the projects really shouldn't be a boil, a boil the ocean type of project. Like we don't need to migrate all of our data up into the cloud and then build a data warehouse and then try to figure out what to do. Start with that end in mind. Um, keep it small, keep it manageable, um, and then ensure that that win. And uh, that's a that's a good way to start. Yeah, and then you become a data evangelist. And so you're everybody's excited and you start talking about your data and everybody comes to you for advice and stuff like that. It's pretty fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, benefits, right? You can make better decisions. We, we've talked about this the entire time. Um, you get near real time ROI, right? So as soon as that analytics program or that analytics project is complete, you have that dashboard, you have your reports, you have that streamlined process. And you can stay ahead of your competition, right? Um, you can stay ahead of the person or the organization across the street um, that, you know, that you're competing against, quite frankly, right? If um, if you're not leveraging analytics, you're you're really losing, uh, you're losing footing if they are. Um, and then what we've seen a lot with, especially with uh, private equity um, owned companies, right? Streamlining their reporting and financial package to Adam's example, right? Turn 40 hours a week into 40 minutes, right? Um, so I'm sorry, 40 hours a month into 40 minutes a month, right? And then think about all the other value add activities that professional, that FPNA person, um, that 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 operational analyst, right? What else could they be doing in the business instead of putting data together if it's already there? How do we create value and create capacity for them in order to do things that are higher and better use of their time? Um, again, recommend the first step. It's a marathon. Adam said it perfectly. This isn't. Uh, this isn't something you should try to boil the ocean doing, right? Pacing is key. Uh, we've seen, I've seen clients get burnt out trying to do everything all at once instead of following that that proof of concept or smaller approach. Be realistic and honest with yourself on your capabilities and your analytics maturity. If you're at level one, understand you're at level one. Don't don't pretend you're at level three because you're you're going to end up hurting hurting yourself more than you're helping the organization. Um, focus on that data foundation first, the quality, the accessibility, the data sources, understanding that piece makes everything a lot easier. And it really drives a lot of those decisions in terms of what your infrastructure and your architecture look like, right? It drives what that BI tool could look like. It drives what KPIs are possible. What do you need to begin collecting today that you weren't collecting yesterday in order to get to those uh, analytics uh, that you're looking for? Um, and then thinking about the data governance throughout the process. If Adam is the one who should have access to that data set, it can't be Adam, Stewart, and Taylor, right? It, it has to be very specific and it should be very, it should be closely monitored to un, to make sure that that governance is being followed. Where you get in trouble, where we've seen clients get in trouble, with too many hands, too many chefs in the kitchen, too many hands in the file. Now nobody knows, now there's no audit process or audit trail of what happened. Um, and then lastly, or the last two bullets, right? It's an iterative journey, right? Um, develop a PLC, iterate, enhance, expand. You know, that is that we've seen that be successful over and over again. And then finally, more like a word of caution, right? Your tools and capabilities should be added based on your needs, not just because it's the latest and greatest. So you're going to hear 
AI, machine learning, your organization may be ready for that if you're at a level three place in terms of maturity. But if you're at level one, again, you're doing more harm than good because your foundation isn't solid. Your processes aren't solid. And now you end up further behind because you tried to you tried to run before you were crawling. And, and that leads to that leads to more heartache and more pain. Yeah. Can I jump in for just Absolutely. one second? Too? Absolutely. There's so many buzzwords out in the industry. I think we might have mentioned AI a little bit. Everybody wants AI. Everybody wants um, generative AI. And just all I have to do is ask it a question. It'll tell me everything. That all comes with the assumption that your data is in an ingestible format that is um, governed and, and, and in good shape, frankly. So before you can use any of that stuff, your data has to be solid. Um, so just know that if you do see shiny stuff out there, um, be aware that it probably comes with with a little bit of a hidden 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 uh, agenda there. That's everything else we've covered. Um, this is really just to make sure we have that information, Taylor. We're um, we're good to go. I, I I know we have about eight minutes left on our on our time. I'm I'm not sure if we want to do a quick Q and A or anything like that, but. Taylor, it's back to you. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was awesome, Stuart and Adam. Thanks so much. Um, I think let's go ahead and open it up. Does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? Uh, yeah, hi. This is Evan Burns. I'll turn on my camera. Um, I am a Salesforce.com consultant, and I am fairly familiar with Tableau. And I wanted to ask you guys um, of the high level analytics tools that sit on top of data warehouses, what would you rank as the top three most popular analytics engines? Stuart, you want me to take a shot of that? Yeah, you can take a shot and I'll, I'll give the commercial answer, I think. I think that's <laughs> the way to go. <laughs> I, I, I would say we, we refer to magic quadrants. Yep, and sure. I say quadrants. A sure. lot, mm -hmm. um, because I don't I don't want to say Gartner or I don't want to sure. be brand specific because there's a few of them, but in general we try to train our staff to be um, uh, experts on the top performers. Okay, um, because we need to be able to support based on being tool agnostic. We got to support in that top right quadrant of, of these, okay um, tool sets. So, Got you know, it. Tableau, Power BI is Click. Um, you know, we're, we're really trying to train up on all of those. What was the last one you said? Sinclair. Click. Click oh, Sense. Click. A yeah. click Sense. Okay. That's one I haven't used. I'm going to write that down. Thank you very much. This has been a really good session, guys. No problem, Evan. I put, I put the uh, Click and Click Sense in the chat. Okay. So Thank you. I see it. Uh, I think, you know, from a... Uh, when I, I'm sorry, when I say commercial sector, I mean, you know, the M&D and, and construction and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that space, at least in the in the context of Plant Moran. Uh, OK, Adam, Adam listed the, you know, the big hitters that we're seeing. Sure. Uh, we're, seeing we're seeing a lot of folks stay within the Microsoft stack in terms of popularity, okay. right? Like I'm not speaking the capabilities or, or what's what's better or what's best, right? Or or worse, but mm -hmm. a lot of folks are staying in Power BI because they, mm -hmm. that's their organization, their Microsoft shop. They have, mm -hmm. you know, their um, their Microsoft licensing. Uh, I will say, in terms of BI, right? Microsoft Power BI, Tableau, and Click. Um, mm -hmm. are seeing, and and then in the ETL space, mm -hmm. so um, extracting, transforming, and loading data, all sure. is popular. Um, but also Click Click will do that as well, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we're not we're not seeing those two have really dominated. I mean, SQL Server. Um, from an ETL perspective is always a data management perspective and then Visual Studio and Azure Data Factory from a from an ETL perspective on the Microsoft stack mm -hmm. um, is, getting, is gaining a lot of popularity because it lives in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. You can access mm -hmm. that. And, um, it plays nicely with an Azure SQL database also in the Microsoft stack, so. Great. And, and Informatica, we, we also right. do a lot of Informatica implementations. Okay. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. All right. Anyone else have anything they want to ask here while we have a couple minutes left? All right. Going once, going twice. 
All right. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. <laughs> Go for there, it. Since there's four minutes left. <laughs> so do you guys, um, do you guys counsel the C-suite, for example, on the highest level reports, which will show how they are doing against short and long-term strategies? Yeah, so uh, I can speak okay. to that. Um, yeah, I mean, we talk to like the as management consultants. Typically, C suite is 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 our is our you know stakeholder, right? That we're trying to make sure that uh, we're answering their questions. So a lot of our work really is being um, I like to say kind of a liaison, right? Sure. In between, hey, like this is your information technology, you know, unit of business. This is the executive suite. A lot of times they don't talk. Not because intentionally or not, right? Like they say, hey, yeah. IT gets this done. IT says yes because it's a C-suite, but they they don't communicate kind of the limitations or mm -hmm. a, a framework or time or timeline for like how long that actually takes, right? So what ends up happening is there's a disconnect between those two groups. So okay. as as consultants, we'll come in and say, hey, CFO, we understand what you want. We understand the strategic vision of your business. Have you communicated this to IT? Have you told them okay. why this is important, why they should be why the system needs to be set up in a certain way? Have you talked to operations about why they need to measure uh, mm -hmm. their performance? Or have you, you probably have talked to accounting because they report to you, but like, do they know really what you're looking for? Do they have the capabilities in order to build that report, right? So okay. it's a lot of connecting those two dots and, and making sure like, uh, to put it, uh, to put it differently, sort of a marriage counselor, if you will, right? Like, hey, like we'll get in the room together. Let's all coordinate and make sure we're on the same page. IT knows the strategy. Mm -hmm. You know the you know the um, you know the data detail. You know as much as you need to know, and let's mirror the two and find a happy medium. So we we certainly help organizations. It's, it's really a part of every delivery model. Yeah, buys or sent, um, meet in the middle in terms of what they expect and what's available, and how do we how do we solve that problem? Great, thank you, Stuart. Yeah, no problem. Adam, Just to add like, add on there, I um. Point Moran's got an excellent culture. I don't think we talked about that very much, but the one of the reasons I started working here was because of the culture and the culture that they touted. And mm -hmm. part of that culture is about servant leadership and it's about how can I help you succeed? And so at the end of the day, our stakeholder being C-suites or, or whomever the initiative is sponsored by, um, we're, we're in it to build a trusted uh, we're in it to be trusted advisors, advisors for our client. Absolutely. And, and so we want to um, ensure that we're doing the right thing and um, making sure that communication is solid. We, we come to all of our projects with solid project management and um, ensure that uh, we get everybody on the same playing field. And sure. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. All right. Thanks for those questions, Evan. Um, My pleasure. With that, we'll probably go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, take a quick second to um, announce our next talent series. So uh, next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about every set of financials tells a story. So if you're interested in that one, please uh, register and join us um there and i just want to say thank you so much for joining us another big thank you to uh Stuart and adam for sharing your expertise today i found that all super interesting it's pretty incredible what you can do out there with um data and all the possibilities are endless so um everyone that's registered for this will get a copy of the slides so you will have their contact information if you want to reach out with questions um, and then this recording will also be posted on the chamber's youtube page if you want to refer back to it at any point so with that, thanks so much. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and uh, hope to see you next week at Talent Tuesday. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Bye-bye.